this session was meant to be uh, a talk about three houses that we would have seen uh, had we visited Norfolk uh, in person rather than online. But in order to do the two houses justice, I've cut it down to just two. Um, time constraints meant that it was impossible to describe them properly in, in, uh, in three houses in 40 minutes. One of the houses is located in Hempnall and the other one is located in Tippenham, both on the clay plateau of the Beckles series as described by Tom earlier in South Norfolk, around 10 miles south of Norwich. Both are close to one of the county watersheds and here the land is so flat that both of these parishes uh, house Second World War airfields. Starting with the Chequers in Hempnall, close to the centre of the village, close to the church and close to the original marketplace. Hempnall is thought to be one of the several four to six thousand acre Saxon estates in Norfolk. The four small parishes that made up the uh, inverted L shape into a square uh, were hived off before doomsday. These parishes housed most of the freemen, leaving only 3% of Hempnall's population as freemen at the time of doomsday. Hempnall was one of the first non-monastic or castle towns to be granted a market and fair in 1226. Uh, this map shows the land use in around 1500 with the remaining common land in yellow. But more importantly, um, unlike most of the Norfolk parishes, um, the woodland uh, is shown in dark green and that still remained in 1500, way until the 19th century in some cases. The red dots are houses and tenements that were mentioned in the manor records of the 14th century. The non-resident manorial law meant that manorial control was weakening in the period up to the 16th century and some of the manor's domain land was sold off to local yeoman farmers. Uh, both the town's fair and market had disappeared by the 16th century. The Chequers did not appear in the manor records until 1564 when it was transferred to a new copy holder, although the rear part of the property is now known to be older than this. It was an inn during the 18th century, during which period most of the external decorative changes were made. And the rear range may have become the schoolhouse after 1754. The property was enfranchised in 1836, and sometime in the mid 19th century, the gable end was rebuilt in polychromatic brickwork and a side extension added. This part was used as a butcher's shop during the 20th century. In each of the slides, the position of the photograph is shown on the floor plan, firstly seen from the street from the southeast. This is the western view, which shows how short the parlour is to the right of the chimney stack. From the northwest, with its many extensions making the whole layout extremely complicated. And from the northwest, showing uh, from the northeast, I beg your pardon, showing the large lateral chimney stack. Much of the outside was Georgianized, and the east or front wall uh, was particularly so. Decorative corbels and rusticated corners were added during this period. Although the earlier wooden casements of iron with iron opening lights were retained. The rear range, which is a single cell building now only of two bays, and we'll, re we'll re re revisit this, has a large external stack on the flank wall seen in the right hand picture and a smaller stack on the west wall seen in the, the left hand picture, which services the arger on the other side of the wall. And the whole is approximately six by four meters. The central principal joist is a far better quality timber than the framing that it sits in. It sits uneasily on the posts at either end, particularly at its north end shown here, where it is attached to a roughly hacked back post with presumably a tenon supporting it, although there is no space to find out whether this exists or not. The principal joist and samples from four of the common joists dated to 1553 with a sequence of 136 rings. Unfortunately, the timber in the frame of this range, the remainder of this range, was all too fast grown to date. 
The principal has a deep plain chamfer with shield stops and the plain common joists are flat laid with diminished haunches and soffit tenons. On the north wall is a painted text with a decorative frame taken from Proverbs. It was restored professionally in 1984 and the style is thought to date to the mid 17th century, although there is no clue in the documentary history as to why it is painted here. At the south end, the principal sits in a shallow notch in the post, although it is not possible to establish whether this is the original post or whether it's a clamp which has been added to the post in order to support the joist. It is of better quality than the rest of the frame and it is chamfered and stopped on both corners. Adjacent to the is a blocked doorway with a simple spandrel. The outer door head is pegged in situ and the one piece spandrel fits into shallow notches in the frame. This door would provide access directly outside, even with the other range in existence. It is one of two examples of this sort of door we found in Hemlal, although the other one was ex situ. The east wall shows the common joists resting on the mid rail, which is the usual Norfolk pattern. But as can be seen from the drawing to the left, several of them overlap the positions of the studs for the wall above confirming that this floor has been inserted. Returning to the issue of whether this cell was the complete building, the eight studs in the eastern wall on the right is double the number of studs in the western wall, which suggests that the west wall is an internal one. So originally there was probably another cell to the west. Upstairs, plaster covers the majority of the timber but the short doors respect the wall plate into the modern extension on the left and the tie beam on the right into the other chamber. The tie beam in the western wall shows the tops of two earlier openings, a further indication that there was once another cell to the west. The floor level of the current room to the west is about 60 centimetres below the floor level of this room. The eastern gable wall shows peg holes for a full set of studs, both above and below the tie beam. The lower ones match those in the mid rail below. So if there was a window in this wall, it did not reach the tie beam. There is no access to the roof in this, in this phase of the house, but it appears to have had two sets of purlins with the ceiling anchored to the lower pair. This isometric drawing of the whole frame shows the remaining timbers and the number of doorways and potential doorways that its use as a pub and schoolroom may have required. Although tall for what was probably once an open to the roof building, the size of the inserted principal joist really does contrast with the remaining frame. Moving into the main range of the house has an extremely narrow single bay parlor, as I mentioned earlier. It's only 2.2 meters wide. This was part of the butcher's shop we saw at the start behind the polychrome brick gable. Initially, we thought that this room had been truncated by the new gable, but as we will see upstairs, it is still in its original position. In the hall, most of the timber has been plastered over or replaced. The peg holes for studs remain in the mid rails and small pieces of wall posts can still be seen but the walls appear to have mostly been replaced by brick. The axial principal joist here is of good quality. With a plain chamfer and shield stop, but this in this case with a bar. The rail across the chimney breast has neat, slightly elongated shield stops, but no bar. The bar on a stop was an unusual feature in the 40 buildings we surveyed in Hemdall, with only one other example. And interestingly, the only taper burn in this house is on the mantel here, a very small one to the left of its centre. The cell to the north has been replaced and rebuilt, constructing a parallel frame adjacent to the hall wall, and the joins between the two halves are not visible anywhere in the house. 
the join here is seen from the other direction. This cell contains two staircases, the modern one on the left of the left photo, and a newel stair rising to the roof in the right photo. It is not known whether this was the original staircase, but although not in a tra traditional position, it would seem likely as there is no real other position for it to be. In the main chamber upstairs, the two principal joists are transverse and are tenoned and pegged to the principal rafters. They are not replacing removed tie beams and are properly jointed in. The ceiling is still below the level of the lower purlins. Both principals have an OG shaped chamfer, again with a bar and shield stop, similar to the room below. But here there is an additional nick which in Norfolk is normally dated to around or after 1625. This OG chamfer shape is unique in Hemnall, and we've not seen it anywhere else in the county either. There, is a mu there are much fancier chamfers, but none exactly like this. This principle and several roof timbers were caught for Dendro, resulting in a 77 year sequence, which provided a likely date of between 1617 and 1620 for the range. At the southern end of the building, the narrow chamber with its polychrome brick face to the gable wall still has pegs for a brace and studs below the wall plate and pegs for studs above and below the tie beam. So this at 2.2 meters is its original extent. The roof above the main range has two rows of purlins, the upper pair clasped by the collars with the principal rafters diminished in size above them. The raised ceiling above the chamber below can be seen as the raised floor here. The central truss has a raised, steeply curved collar, presumably to allow extra headroom in the attic. This is also the frame where the purlins change height. Finally, there are two Georgian bow or skeleton door latches that were presumably part of the overall Georgian makeover that this house underwent. But they do not match the latch found in another Hempel house, which Linda Hall has dated examples to 1616, and we're still awaiting uh, to undertake Dendro in the house that this latch is fitted to. So in summary then, Chequers is two buildings later joined together. The structure of the rear range did not date, but the floor was inserted in 1553. Was it a two bay open hall as part of a larger house? If the lateral stack was in existence before the floor was inserted, was it a separate kitchen? Or was the stack installed to heat the new room? Unfortunately, the manor records are completely silent before 1564, so we're unable to tell. The front range is built on more conventional lines, albeit with a tiny parlour end, and dated to 1617 to 1620, when the records show a shame, change of copy holder. The various divided uses of the two halves and its use as a pub and its many extensions have made interpretations quite difficult. The second house is located in Tippenham to the west of Hemnall, but still on the clay plateau. The southern part of Tibbenham is shown here on the first edition Ordnance Survey map. The green, known as Long Row, sitting along the southern parish boundary, was the only remaining common land in the parish in 1790. Parliamentary enclosure was 30 years later in 1820. The six moated sites in the parish are shown in blue, and there were seven manors holding land in Tibbenham. The sites of three of the manor houses are shown in yellow. There were 17 scattered small farmsteads in the area, 10 of which were sited on the common edge. And the fact that three of these were moated sites seems to fix the date of the common edge to the 14th century or so. Looking east along the enclosure road today, it fully meets the description of Norfolk as flat. The southern edge of the common can be seen as the hedge line running parallel to the road on the right hand side.
Dyson's farm can also be seen in the photo, but set well back from the enclosure road. Dyson's farm is located here. Tiverton farm, which we will be using as a comparison in this talk, is literally right next door. And these are the other eight along the two miles of long row. Typically in the Norfolk pattern, only one of them is still a farmhouse. The remainder have been sold off and in renovated. Dyson's farm is a large two-story plus part attic, three-celled house with what appears to be a two-story porch or stair turret, seen here from the north facing the farmyard. There is a later stack added to its eastern gable end, which we will see inside. And the western gable appears to have a jetty again to which we will return. And seen from the south, the view from the direction of the road itself. Overall, the house is 18 metres long and a fraction under six metres wide externally around 60 by 20 feet. Typical tripartite plan, parlour to the warmer west and services to the cooler east. The cross passage is now partitioned from the hall by a later wall and a lobby entry door now blocked was in use in 1984 when surveyed by the Norfolk Archaeological Unit when the house was described as near derelict. Since then, extensive refurbishment has taken place involving the reuse of some timber and the introduction of some historic timber from elsewhere, which makes some interpretation difficult. The stair in the surface bay to the right is a later insertion. The original stair by the stack is still in use. The porch or stair turret can be seen to be built at a different angle to the house and separate from it. It covers part of the north windows in both stories. We had hoped to be able to date this house and port by Dendro, but all the timber used, like so much in Norfolk in the period, was too fast grown with insufficient rings to be able to date. The south wall of the house, drawn from the inside, here as built. There are four windows upstairs, all of which have shutter slides. Downstairs, the windows adjacent to the cross passage has no shutter slide, but there is a slide above the other window in the hall. In the service bay to the left, the south wall has been largely replaced by brick up to the mid rail, and the ground floor timbers in the parlour to the right are mostly replacements. At some time, apparently soon after building, the parlour end distorted, as could be seen in the parlour chamber window to the right. resulting in this situation of the south wall, here where the distorted window has been replaced, whereas the one in the north wall remains. So starting a tour of the house from the porch, looking down the cross passage, the spandrels in the doorway and others we will see are of stylized roses and thought to be original. Turning round and looking towards the porch door, the porch can be seen to be very close studded, but the timbers are all plain and completely undecorated. And the east wall of the porch shows a later inserted window. The original stud pegs, which don't match the mullions, are still visible in the mid rail above it, uh, and it has obviously been subsequently blocked up. The fixing points for the porch to the house are not visible anywhere. Looking south down the cross passage, the hall service room wall is to the left and the inserted wall dividing off the passage from the hall is on the right. The two service room doors have, their head, have had their heads raised and have modern plain spandrels inserted.
Inside, the two service rooms can be seen to have been combined into one room with a half into the external stack we saw earlier. Mortises and pegs for the, in the principal joist show the position of the original dividing wall. The brick underbuilding to the mid rail in English bond can be seen to the left of the window and repaired modern brickwork to the right. And the stairs are inserted as we will see later. Unusually for Norfolk, the common joists are tenoned into the mid rail and only rest on the principal joist in the center rather than the more usual method the other way around. Returning to the cross passage, the door through the inserted dividing wall leads into the hall. And in the hall, this is the south wall with a glazed window with molded mullions to the left of the story post with no shutter slide above it. There are remnants of a groove in the story post matching the one opposite. This is similar to one in neighboring Tibbenham farm shown in the left photo where the groove remains and it is thought to have housed some form of decorative slip. On the right of the post is the site of another window, this one with a shutter slide groove and pegs for mullions in the mid rail. The studs either side of the window are replacements, so the original sill height can't be determined. The north wall shows a similar layout. A shallow window with moulded mullions next to the cross passage. This was overlapped by the building of the porch. The site of the window to the left of, has pegs in the mid rail, but again the studs either side are replacements, so the sill height cannot be determined. Quite why both walls have two windows adjacent to each other, with the glazed ones closest to the cross passage, is unclear. Glass was expensive, explaining why they're small but one was lost to the porch, apparently built not long after the house was built. The principal joist across the room has a plain chamfer with simple shield stops, and the common joists are very much for display. They're almost the same size as the spaces between them. The stack is built in English bond, and there is a rebuilt bread oven below to the left. The original mantle height is shown by the white line that can be seen to be just below the current shelf by the change in brick size below it. The parlour suffered from the distortion of the frame that we saw earlier and much of the timber has been replaced and covered in a Georgian plastering out including the axial principal joist. The mantle fits the opening with a chamfer and elongated shield stops and has a slight camber. The spandrels set into the chamfered door frame depict saddled dragons and are thought to be of the arts and crafts period. The lobby access through this door is now plastered out so it's not possible to tell whether the lobby entry door seen from the outside was a later insertion, although the presence of the cross passage and porch implies that it was lobby entry was in use during the inspection of 1984, as I said earlier. In the parlour chamber above, the full distortion of the frame can be seen. The crossed principles have deep chamfers and are thought to be late 16th century. Again, we had hoped to use dendro to date aspects of this house, but the timber was adjudged too fast grown to be worth coring. The corner post is jowled in both directions. In a similar way to a few other prestige houses we have looked at in Norfolk, the jowling has been paired back in the corner to reduce its projection into the room without reducing its strength, but seems to be a decorative feature. Looking at the north wall with the distorted window seen from the farmyard earlier, the door behind the owner accesses the attic stairs as can be seen on the floor plan top left. The stairs next to the stack have never gone into the roof. As we will see later, the first floor may have been open to the roof for a period of time. In this room, the crossed principal joists appear to be placed on top of the wall plates, indicating this ceiling was probably inserted too. 
In the lobby and stairs is a double pegged edge half scarf joint above the blocked inserted window, which was used to light the stairs. And there is a large rice knife cut carpenter's mark of two on this brace. The corner brace shows a one. The sequence for the braces is separate from that of the studs and posts. The system that we also saw in a few houses in Hemlong, but not in all of them, most have a continuous sequence for all their marks. On the north side of the stack is another small window and a scratched timber mark, which is similar to a merchant's mark. There is a similar mark on the wall plate in the west wall, which we'll see uh, fairly soon. The hearth in the hall chamber has a shallow four centred arch of brick, which has been plastered and ashlard. And the three other hearths in this house just have simple timber, timber bresomers. The old stack arrangement seems to point to this hearth being a later insertion. The three decorative flues are obviously rebuilt with thicker molded bricks, but the original stack appears to be T-shaped with three flues with an additional axial flue to the east above this room, the base of which is built of rough but slightly thicker bricks. The partition across this, the eastern side of this room is another insertion. It is demonstrated by the only peg holes in the slightly cambered time beam, two sets of three for anchoring the braces to the wall posts, of which more later. Moving to the service room chamber, the original window in the service chamber south wall has had one mullion removed for an iron opening light and there is a shutter slide above it. And the filled mortises uh, in the mid rail show that this floor was inserted. It shows, sorry, that the stairs were inserted and the floor was original. In the northeast corner, the braces are straighter but note that the corner post has not been decoratively cut back as it was in the parlour chamber. Understandable perhaps because there was no lesser need for decoration, but the close studding here is a significant use of timber for an unvisited upstairs room. The studs here forming almost 50% of the wall. Moving on to the porch chamber, It has original windows in all three of its walls. And looking back towards the house, the structure can be seen to be separate of this level too. Note it has reverted to the usual Norfolk pattern of joists tenoned into the principal and resting on the rails at either end. One mullion of the window of the hall chamber was covered by the porch's erection and can be seen behind the peacock's feathers. The carpenter's marks here have been made with a gouge or punch rather than a chisel or race knife, not something we see much of in Norfolk. Here the tool used appears to be about one and a half centimetres in diameter. Moving back to the parlour chamber at the western end, this is the window in the gable wall. Firstly, more gouge cut carpenter's marks, but here made with a larger non-circular gouge. And secondly, the other occurrence of what may have been the timber merchant's mark. Above this in the gable wall itself, numbers 12 and 13 have been apparently made with a third different gouge. Making an X with the gouge can't have been that easy. We know that the porch is later than the house as it partially covers two of the windows in the north wall. Since gouge made marks are unusual in Norfolk, was this work done by the same carpenter who repaired the collapsing west end? It was this work that re-leveled the wall plates of this end and made the jetty in the gable end. The roof at this end of the house consists of a single row of purlins with no principal rafters. Clasping collar coincided with faced half scarf joints in both purlins.
Access is restricted to the remainder of the roof, but on the other side of the stack, above the center of the hall chamber, are two large arched braces supporting the collar. The principles are diminished in size above the collar, resulting in this section, strongly suggesting that the central room was originally open to the roof with a display roof, which again compares with neighboring Tippenham Farm, except that there the parlor chamber is the one with the display roof rather than the hall chamber. Another similarity between Dyson's farm and neighboring Tippenham farm are its decorative chimney flues. Although the Tippenham farm flues appear to be earlier, possibly in their original narrow bricks. In summary then, here are two very different timber framed houses built fairly close together, but on the main part of the Norfolk Claylands. Both were either built or significantly extended during the late 16th or early 17th century during the Great Rebuilding Period, like so many that we have found in the area. The Front Range at the Chequers and Dyson's Farm were apparently built new in this period, but given their positions in the centre of town and along the common edge with all the other farms, it is most likely that they were rebuilds, presumably because the earlier houses were incapable of adaptation. The rear range at the Chequers is different in that it existed before this period and was updated by having a floor inserted in the middle of the 16th century. We hope to be able to date the frame via oxygen isotope analysis in the future. Both have survived because they continue to be kept relevant by successive alterations and are good representatives of the range of yeoman sized houses in this part of Norfolk. Thank you for listening.